Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first virtual annual meeting for the Regional Monitoring Program for Water Quality in San Francisco Bay. Uh, we're excited to have you joining us this morning. Uh, we have a great lineup of speakers to keep you engaged throughout the day. Uh, I'm going to go over some logistics for today and then introduce our MC, Tom Mumley. Um, my name is Melissa Foley. I'm the program manager for the RMP. Um, just some logistics for today. Uh, given the number of attendees, we're not going to be able to offer uh, tech support. So if you're having trouble with the audio or the video, um, please close the application and join again. If that doesn't work, go ahead and give your computer a restart, restart and try to join. If none of those work, or if you need to come and go during the meeting today, uh, know that the meeting is being recorded and most of the talks will be posted to the RMT website uh, tomorrow. Uh, for the meeting, the attendees can use the Q&A function to send questions to the, to the speakers and during the moderated sessions. Uh, you'll find that Q&A box uh, either at the bottom of your screen if you're using um, a laptop or a desktop, um, probably at the top if you're using uh, an iPod. Um, but you should be able to find that and then submit your questions. Please feel free to submit your questions at any point during the talk um, and we'll keep track of those. And then finally, there will be a survey that will launch when you leave the meeting. Uh, please take a minute to fill that out. That really helps us as we're planning uh, planning the next meeting and to learn learn from this meeting as well. So with that, um, I would now like to introduce uh, Dr. Tom Mumley, who will be leading us through the day. And uh, Tom is the Assistant Executive Officer at the San Francisco Bay Water Board and has been working with the Water Board for 37 years. Uh, Tom has been a major player in the RMP since its beginning, helping create this program that started in 1993. Tom is also a member of the RMP Steering Committee and has been the chair since 2011. He's also an active member of many of the RMP work groups. So, Tom, take it away. Well, thank you, Melissa, and welcome, everybody. And I'm, I'm pleased to be able to say this a, a, a much greater group this year, given the, the virtual meeting. Of course, we're challenged with cooperative coronavirus, you can't have a live meeting, but that's the downside. The positive side is that we are able to open up attendance to a much greater audience. So welcome to what I, I will quote Louisa Valiella, which always says, the RMP annual meeting is the best one day of science every year. And it's a reflection of, of how we here in the Bay Area uh, use science to drive our regulatory and management decisions. And it's created a, very, a, a spirit of collaborative joint fact finding. And as you know, I mention every year, this is, this is a celebration. Uh, uh, so again, I welcome many new, new attendees and the regulars. And unfortunately and sadly, one regular attendee isn't, is no longer with us. A very close friend to some of us, a colleague to many of us, and a, uh, and a champion of, of the Bay for all of us. Uh, we unfortunately lost Bruce Wolf this past year. Bruce, as many of you know, was uh, worked for over 40 years at the uh, San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board and nearly half of it, the last half of his career as executive officer. So he was the epitome of using the science generated by the RNP and the collaborative spirit that it's inspired to, uh, to inform our regulatory management decisions at the board. But in, uh, in Bruce's spirit, and I tell you, I, I reflect on, uh, on his spirit and how he affected me a lot, I, I need to carry on because he was a doer and he also was, he was good at telling me, shut up and get on with it, Tom. So uh, sadly, Bruce, uh, we miss you, but you will continue to inspire us. Uh, well, so most of you, as you, as you came on online, you, you may have picked up your virtual copy of the, the annual update. You know, as you many of you know, every other year we do a pulse of the estuary, a more in-depth uh, annual report with articles, and then off the year we do the update. This is the update year, but it still includes uh, a, a, an overview of the management and, and stakeholder interest to drive the the RNP uh, highlights of recent and, on, and ongoing accomplishments and uh, 
an overview of coming attractions and then updates in all our in our program areas including the uh, the status and trends program and uh, and by the way, if, if you don't write this down, I found it pretty easy to get to it by just just searching the term SFA RNP update, and it easily popped up in a in a web search. Before we start the program, I also want to uh, call attention to things that are in play. We're 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 come to a point in the RNP where we're where we're looking at doing self searching of what we're, we've been doing and what we need to do. We have um, more and more needs relative to the available budget. So we have to be strategic and efficient about how we do things. But what's really, what is obvious is that we have an ever growing interest and need to monitor for emerging contaminants. At the same time, coincident of that, we have less need to continue to monitor at the, the level we have in the past for legacy pollutants. Doesn't mean we're not gonna monitor for legacy pollutants, that downward arrow just means we're gonna put less effort, but we'll, we'll continue to do what's necessary. It also doesn't mean the legacy pollutants are dropping in levels. Unfortunately, we know that the, there's so much reservoir of, of things like PCBs and mercury in the bay that they will continue to, uh, to fuel the bioaccumulation machine for, for a while. But we, ha we have been generating data to inform management decisions to, uh, to stem any increase. Other, another area that, are, that we are embracing in the RMP is more and more emphasis on nutrients in the Bay and sediment in the Bay, it, both of which raise issues that are bigger than what the RMP in and of itself can, can accommodate on, it, on its own. Particular in the sediment arena, we've always gave, given sediment attention, particular contaminant bound sediment, but there's a growing, ever growing interest in understanding the fifth fate of physical transport of sediment as a whole relative to uh, dredging, dredge disposal, uh, uh, restoration, habitat restoration, sea level rise resilience, as well as contaminant transport. So these, these are getting further attention, which put it all together, it's given us cause to step back and take a close look at our current status and trends program. And so we've, we've started an intensive review and, and likely redesign, particularly as we need to have a, a platform that better serves our, our emerging contaminant monitoring interests so we can, uh, as needed, screen for new ones and track trends of those that have identified to be of concern and, and modify the current legacy pollutant-based design. So that's a work in progress. There's an overview of that in the update. I welcome, you know, encourage you to look at that, and this will be something we'll probably be, speak more of at next year's meeting. But let's uh, focus on today's meeting. Let's get on with the show, so to speak. We have four major sessions. First in the morning, it's a municipal wastewater, followed by one on sediment. And then this afternoon, we have a session on contaminants emerging concern, following one focused on urban runoff issues. We have a great group of speakers in each of these sessions. We've mixed it up a bit this year uh, by inviting some external speakers with some, some timely subject matter related to these session categories, as well as inviting some of our science experts to present to give us some insight as to why we, why we picked them as experts to advise us in our, in our various program areas. <coughs> and I'm, I'm certain that you will you will enjoy today's program again the the best day of science of the year so let's move into our first session i'm well before i do i just want to remind you that uh that we're not going to as as the speakers talk you can write questions during the during the talks and then we will we will curate and do their best to respond to those questions at the dialogue at the end of each session so let's start with session one, and I'll start. And I want to introduce the moderator, which is Eileen White. Eileen White is director of wastewater at the East Bay Municipal Utilities District, which is the, the large municipal wastewater system that serves a very big part of the East Bay. She's prior to that, she was a long-term manager in the water supply side of East Bay Mud. So she definitely has very great insight to the one water concept, which is emerging. 
She's a, she's a key leader in the wastewater community here in the Bay Area and a great spirit in our joint fact-finding fact finding collaborative efforts within the RNP as well as the Associated Nutrient Management Strategy. And she's, she participates on the steering committee of that strategy. And I have to mention that Eileen is a, is a civil engineer and got her degree at UC Berkeley. So she, is, as well as I, am a cow bear. So go bears. So Eileen, take it over. Great. Thanks so much, Tom. Well, I'm real excited. We have three excellent speakers for session one this morning. Our first speaker, Dr. Peter Tango, is going to discuss Chesapeake Bay management, including their goals, outcomes, and lessons learned. From there, we're going to transition to Dr. Alexandria Bain, who's going to discuss her exciting work she and her team have been leading to monitor wastewater for the presence of coronavirus. And she's going to describe how this can be a very useful tool for medical and public health professionals. Very timely. This wouldn't have been on the agenda a year or two ago. And then finally, our third speaker in this morning's session is going to be Miguel Mendez, who's going to discuss modern disinfectant chemicals in wastewater which is very important as the RMP continues to monitor contaminants in the health of San Francisco Bay. And as we all know, there's been an increase in the use of disinfecting chemicals with the coronavirus that hit the United States early this year. Um, and what I would like to do before I introduce Dr. Peter Tango is kind of just set up their framework. I think we all know that San Francisco Bay receives some of the highest nitrogen loads among estuaries worldwide but it has yet to exhibit problems typical of nutrient-enriched estuaries. A wide range of monitoring and special studies are underway to understand the amplifications on what bay water quality associated with changes in nutrient levels and other factors. The information we're gonna hear from Dr. Peter Tango this morning shall be useful as SFEI, the regional board, and the broad stakeholder group continues the science in evaluation of the management actions for San Francisco Bay. Now, Dr. Peter Tango was hooked on science ever since his fifth grade teacher inspired him to start a birding life list. That was 1976. A passion for science and maintaining the birding life list continues. Peter's degrees in forest biology, his master's in wildlife science, and his fisheries management PhD have supported the work of his position with the U.S. Geological Survey as the Chesapeake Bay Monitoring Coordinator for over 14 years. During his spare time, Dr. Peter Tango enjoys running, fishing, hunting, hiking, gardening, riding, biking, and enjoying just good health, fitness, and the great outdoors. Dr. Tango is also a science advisor for the Nutrient Management Strategy Program that's implemented by SFEI. Without further to do, Dr. Peter Tango is gonna to present to us his speech today. Thanks, Eileen, and welcome, everybody. Grab your coffee. Where's the muffins and donuts and bagels? Uh, <laughs> it's just not right here. I <laughs> uh, really appreciate the opportunity to join everybody. And uh, hey, I don't want to slow things down for the day, so uh, appreciate the intro, and let's kick this thing off. I'm going to share my screen. All right, and I think that gets us to where we need to be. Uh, welcome everybody again. Really appreciate the opportunity to join you. Would love being out there with you, but uh, all, all things considered, nice to be with everybody here today, and healthy and moving forward. And I'll bring to you today this chat on, uh, I'm going to set my timer while I'm doing this, but I'm going to talk to you about shifting baselines, new insights and adaptive management in Chesapeake Bay. And we'll give you an overview, touch bases on those elements. And I think they're, as we've learned from working with each other, there are nice lessons that, that can be thought about taken from the combined work that we see on the, the various estuaries. For those of you that may not be around Ch Chesapeake Bay Science and realize that the first agreement across policy groups and uh, across the watershed was among jurisdictions back in 1983. And it helped set goals for recovery of the bay the 1970s and early 80s studied deemed it in, in deep decline, and uh, this was an opportunity for the watershed states and D.C. to come together and improve the, the lot of the conditions out there. 
Since that time, there have been a series of updates, reviews, revisions, and in 20, 2010, perhaps what's best known is the total maximum daily load, which reflects allocations of nutrient and sediment targets. And really this, uh, this picture on the right-hand side of the graphic reflects the pollution diet recovery plan, where we're trying to take present conditions that, that may be less than desirable and apply a relatively simple conceptual model that says if we can reduce nutrient sed and sediments, we expect to improve the habitat for living resources and see an improvement there. Uh, more recently, the 2014 agreement builds on that. There are 10 ecosystem health out goals with 31 outcomes that now take not only the water quality into consideration, watershed health, stream health, societal diversity in our leadership, there are goals for stewardship and public access, as well as living resources such as blue crabs, oysters, aquatic vegetation, and uh, black ducks. So the suite of those are worked on together with, for management strategies and implementation plans that support this very broad scale agreement. Uh, and today I'm gonna mostly focus on the, the uh, water elements here, but we'll bring in the living resources because I think that, that adds significance to what we're talking about today. As I mentioned, the, uh, our water quality criteria fundamental to the total maximum daily load were the derivation of criteria that were published back in 2003. And 500 plus scientists got together, worked for several years, which built on decades of science before them to, to set up a common set of habitat classifications. They divided the segments of the bay by, into management, management uh, segments with boundaries that had both uh, hydrodynamic relevance as well as biological relevance. The water quality criteria, such as dissolved oxygen requirements for these habitats, recognize the diversity of living resources there and set up criteria relative to the specific resources that were being targeted. And as you have a regional monitoring program, we have watershed and bay monitoring to assess the progress relative to those criteria and evaluating assessment. Uh, with the TMDL specifically through the water quality standards that encapsulate this full body of information. Over the decades, that earliest agreement was really targeted at reducing point sources, and there was a 40% control of, uh, of controllable loads was targeted. And uh, perhaps some of the impetus, impetus in that is really looking at just one element of our bay, the second largest estuary, the Potomac estuary within, within the Chesapeake. And the history in that colored, colored chart up on top goes from the looking at around 1900 when we consider that there was nothing more than sewers flowing out into the Potomac estuary, no treatment of the effluent. And then we see the timing of when primary, secondary, and advanced treatments come online. Uh, the graph below represents in its early years, there's just one data point for 1912 about summer dissolved oxygen, oxygen conditions just below Washington DC at the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. So they modeled conditions based on some of the available information. And then you see at the time that primary treatment goes in around 1937, that we start to get some real data on what summer conditions and we're finding abysmal hypoxia, fish kills, uh, really difficult conditions for the multiple decades until the 1970s where secondary treatment comes online and we see improvements in water quality in response to those that continue on to today and uh, continue to expand in the health of the, the waterway there. So uh, this is a thanks to Norb Jaworski who was an outstanding scientist in terms of his work to do a lot of data culling, data analysis and uh, really help in putting this picture together. We do a combined point source and non-point source management because we see that point source doesn't get there all and doesn't get us there all on its own. And this is a particular, particularly increased interesting study from Keith Eshelman and his group on surface water quality improving in the watershed in our delivery of what loads are in the watershed to the bay uh, through the Clean Air Act and the effects of the Clean Air Act with technological adv advances to reduce the amount of nitrogen in the air and subsequent wet nitrogen deposition is uh, being tracked in those streams. The particular sites that he picked, 13 sites, were on forested watersheds. So if you're looking for some sort of reference without a lot of other anthropogenic footprint out there, uh, it was very nice to see that throughout these sites, he had consistent patterns in terms of the 
tracking of reduced nitrogen deposition and consequently nitrogen concentrations that were being delivered to the streams and subsequently down, to, down towards the bay. Uh, we also recognize that in population growth, for example, there are other, other issues that are counteracting some of those trends. So there's a patchwork across the watershed, but combined we see point source loads being controlled and improving water quality conditions and non-point source controls aiding uh, reductions of pollution to Chesapeake Bay. So ideally, if we go back to that model, that conceptual model I mentioned, the pollution diet in theory, if we lower nutrients, you get all those, all those interactions in between to start producing positive responses in the habitat. And this is just one piece, one case study off of the Potomac River to give you a sense of, does the model hold up? Do we see those sort of responses if we track it through time? And there was a particularly large point source on, this, on the waterways delivering water to Gunston Cove, which is an arm off of the Potomac River, just in the Washington DC area. And we see that it was approximately a 90% reduction in loads over several years as they worked on wastewater treatment there. The subsequent measure we would like to see if you're decreasing loads delivered, you hope that you can pick that up down in the estuary. And once you're in the Potomac estuary in Gunston Cove, we see that over a period of 30 years, there has been a subsequent about 90% decline in total phosphorus measures. You're hoping that in that process, you're decreasing the amount of limiting nutrient to the plankton and reducing the chlorophyll levels that were choking that waterway. Uh, here we see levels going from the 1970s, bordering on 100 micrograms per liter, and more recently, measures down around 10, 10, 20, 30 micrograms per liter. So you're getting that ecosystem feedback, the ecosystem response you want. Ideally, if you're lowering chlorophyll, that should be less plankton in the water and better water clarity, and we see that it took about 20 years before the water clarity response started to improve. But with added light, if we go to that bottom set of graphics, those green, the green within there represents in the Gunston Cove, the expansion of aquatic grasses in response to improved clarity conditions in that region. So uh, we have the water quality and living resource response that we desire. It does take time. We're looking at 20, 30 years of measuring from the initial, initial reductions until we're seeing the response there. So it takes a little while, but uh, we're following the model and uh, seeing good, good improvements there. Is that happening on the 64,000 square mile, 18 trillion gallon in waterway in the bay? Are we seeing any sort of response there? The, the, the big picture, the big target? And uh, here were two studies that using the data, the, the data points belong to Beaver et al. Uh, in 2013. And the blue line is just taken from the estimated drawing of the regression line using the slope of the work given in Zhu et al. Folks are using the data. We see parallel declines in the amount of annual hypoxic volume days, the measure of the total volume through time that's being measured from 1985 through 2015 and 2014 approximately in this, in this set of graphics. And uh, what was nice is that even though they had slightly different values that they were estimating the aerial hypoxia threshold, uh, both of them have parallel responses, show about one day a year improvement. So uh, the good news is we had 25 years of improvement and uh, you might take a lesson there to say that's good, but with 100 days to go, rapid math says we have about 100 years left at this trajectory. But uh, seeing a 20% improvement roughly in over the 25 years suggests that on a large scale in the biggest part of the bay, there's some positive response. Well, working with the models that were built off that data, we recognize that there, were, there, there was this suite of conditions that are used to drive the scenario set up and uh, what that means for how we're using a relatively common hydrologic set of conditions to then scenario and look forward into the future about what possible management practices can do, non-point and point source, what we can target for best management practices. And uh, that's all fine and good, except for recognizing that we have non-stationary conditions and Bob Hirsch and, and some of his colleagues there published uh, about a decade ago this idea that the idea of working within a stationary concept and looking at looking at our ecosystem really doesn't fly anymore. And I think we all recognize that the fundamentals of what's going on around us are changing in some ways very directionally and that we need to take account of those when we're starting to plan for the future. So uh, 
what type of shifting baselines do we have? Well, obviously, population is increasing. And in our area, in the last 70 years, we've seen approximately more than doubling of the population to the Chesapeake Bay watershed. That footprint is going to be significant in terms of land use and land cover change. But the, uh, the trajectory is, is really stable in terms of its pace. So uh, we don't expect that to turn around anytime soon. Other shifting baselines of importance, we know about global temperature change. Uh, looking at that on a local scale, of course, the folks working with management around the watershed, they want to know what's going on in their backyard, their watershed, the Chesapeake Bay watershed. The graphic on the upper right shows in darker color the strongest trends and the most rapid increase in air temperature scattered throughout the watershed. And then at our monitoring stations, some of our monitoring stations are represented here that have a particular type of data that was used to measure the stream temperature assessment. And uh, largely throughout the watershed, we see increasing temperatures or tending towards increasing temperatures. So air temperature, the stream temperature, uh, changing the habitat conditions up in the watershed. And then if we consider more broadly the meteorology and climate influences, some Great minds around the watershed have this very nice conceptual picture of what's going on. If you start pulling in not just temperature, I, on the right hand side, I do demonstrate that our long term water quality monitoring data since 1985 takes that air temperature and water temperature in the watershed and consistent patterns again throughout most of the, the bay and its, and its tributaries for increasing temperatures. Those have significant importance in terms of driving things like stratification, but they're complemented by sea level effects, sea level rise effects that are trending upward and starting to take on exponential, exponential paces um, within, within the bay itself. And add to that things like record precipitation events, getting outside that envelope of stationarity, seeing, seeing these record years and, and some of the significant flooding and what that does to our loadings. Uh, then kind of blends, again, our, our management needs to look at the point and non point influences in the context of these changes that are going on and recognized around the watershed. Our modelers do outstanding work and that model that's been built to consider what targeting is for nutrient and sediment management to improve bay habitat health. Uh, recently looked at the influence of climate on our bottom dissolved oxygen change. That middle of the bay is huge to the TMDL. If you get that right, we feel like everything else is working, working really well overall. And uh, so they pitted the, the major changes that we see. You've got sea level rise that I just showed you, watershed flow that I talked about, increasing temperatures. And when you take that into the context of what's targeted for dissolved oxygen change and improving that, uh, sea level rise and watershed flow are actually positive, net positives on, on conditions. They're certainly not negatives. In the, in the grandest scheme to whether or not we're going to meet dissolved oxygen change in related relation to the trajectory of climate influence on the bay. But influence of increased temperature is a real bugaboo for us. And uh, overall, that is a dominant factor that the predominant influence on whether or not we can meet our water quality standards going into the future for dissolved oxygen, which is central to our targets that were designed to get us to, that, to those endpoints of the habitat that was needed for living resources. In terms of other elements of change that are influencing our new insights and, and really documenting them well, the Susquehanna River Basin is the most significant, the largest part of the watershed. Upstream of that star is about 60% of the watershed that flows into the upper part of the, of the Chesapeake Bay. And in 1928, when they put the Conowingo Dam in, uh, that began collecting sediment. You all were talking about issues of sediment. Well, th this was our biggest BMP for controlling, controlling uh, nutrients and sediments coming down out of the, the Susquehanna watershed into the bay. And uh, more recently, after, since 1928, there's a bevy of signs to show that the capacity of the dam, that lower reservoir has filled up. And we are now in a different state in terms of trying to manage our resources. Uh, in particular, this is one of three figures I could show you about whether it's nitrogen, phosphorus, or sediment loads, but in more recent history, the early 1990s, we saw that dam was trapping about 50% of the phosphorus coming down out of the watershed. By 2000s, 
flight capacity was really starting to te give us evidence of reaching a new equilibrium and uh, filling up its available capacity as the phosphorus being trapped declined. And now in the most recent decade, we see that it, we're essentially dealing with dynamic equilibrium where anytime there is a large storm, about 100,000 CFS or more, you start to see scouring of the, the, bay, of the sediment, which is introducing sediment and nutrients into the bay that wouldn't normally have been there in the past 100 years. So um, we have a new, new insights, new directions, new, new things to account for while trying to manage the bay. And there's a watershed implementation plan and a host of studies trying to figure out how we best address that now going into the future. With all these changes, uh, it's evident that our watershed model, in this case, the challenges of showing that the monitoring work and the, uh, and the watershed modeling work are showing similar patterns gives people confidence in their efforts to control nutrients and sediment and uh, improve the bay conditions. We see that uh, here, that table on the right, the green reflects nine tributaries and their trends where things are going well but all that yellow and white is either no trend or poor trends and conditions are not matching up precisely everywhere we look with the model. So that is uh, a, a constant effort to match modeling and modeling, gain greater understanding, incorporate that into it, improve the, the accuracy of our model predictions to give us proper feedback on our targets for, uh, for pollution management. Some of the other new insights and changing, shifting baselines and uh, something that might be of interest when you think about, when I think about San Francisco Bay and the importance of the fishery and the interactions there to, that you have with, with filter feeders and what the fish community influence can be in terms of how well the, the bay responds to nutrient loading and, and processing. Um, probably the biggest, the biggest change in our fishery and fish community I could point to is blue catfish that were introduced in the 1970s that are now probably the most abundant predator uh, in the bay. 100 million or more, some of the tributaries are upwards of 75% of the biomass of fish. And uh, these things like to eat. They are large, they are abundant, and they uh, not only target the array of food resources that, that are available out in the bay, but some of those that we are trying to manage and restore from historical commercial fisheries like shad. And uh, so even though there's outstanding work to remove many of the passageways, reopen thousands of miles of historic, historic habitat up in the watershed, reconnect the bay to, it, to the watershed and uh, try to help those fish that we're trying to, trying to improve habitat for in the bay and the watershed. We see as the temperature is changing up in the watershed and also the fish community that might be, I wouldn't want to be, a young shad trying to navigate those 143 pound catfish mounds. So uh, it represents another challenge and, and this is just an example to say after 20 years, for example, on the James River where, where they started stocking the blue catfish and uh, we, we've seen no improvements in terms of the shad recovery in that river and some of the other Virginia rivers are either stable or declining as well where there's 75% of the abundance is uh, our biomass is blue cats. So fish community here is being evaluated as another sign of how do we deal with our management and uh, maybe we can eat our way through. They are delicious, I will say. So in closing, appreciate that we have a variety of best management practices. There's a best management practice work group within our, within our partnership, uh, agriculture, as well as urban BMPs, point and non-point source, and we're using the adaptive management framework to uh, improve our ecosystem decisions and drive our recovery. <laughs> I'll close with saying that in summary, substantial progress has been made to improve water quality and living resource health, but we recognize there's more to be done. New insights are made each year and there are shifting baselines in physics, chemistry and biology. While our management continues to account for these new insights and shifting baselines, we're updating our policies and implementing an adaptive management framework to guide restoration and recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter, for your presentation. I just want to remind the audience to go ahead and answer, put your questions into the Q&A section, and we'll be taking questions at the end. We have time allocated after our three speakers. And our next speaker is Miguel Mendez, and he's an environmental analyst 
for the Clean Water Program and the Bay Regional Monitoring Program at SFEI focusing on emerging contaminants. Miguel received his BA in Chemistry from Williams College and his Master's in Science in Environmental Engineering from Stanford University. Prior to joining SFEI, he studied the effects of sea level rise on the secondary wastewater treatment processes at the Southeast Wastewater Treatment Plant in San Francisco. Without further ado, Miguel, you can tell us all about what you're learning about emerging contaminants and disinfectants in wastewater. Hi, Eileen. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So hi, everyone. I just want to reintroduce myself. My name is Miguel Mendez, and I'll be talking to you about quaternary ammonium disinfectant chemicals in wastewater in the Bay. I just want to again uh, reiterate some facts about myself. Um, I'm one of the newest members of SFEI. Uh, I joined in January of 2020. Um, I'm a recent graduate of Stanford University um, with a master's in environmental engineering. So to get directly into the talk, I wanted to give everyone an outline of what I'll be discussing today. Uh, so first, I want to talk a little bit about quaternary ammonium compounds, and in particular, why they're important and what they are. Um, I also want to talk about the relationship to COVID-19 um, and why it's even more important now for us to think about uh, quaternary ammonium compounds. Uh, next, I also want to talk about the environmental pathways and fate that QACs take in the environment, and particularly a study that the that SFEI has participated in in sediment, in QACs and sediment. I also uh, want to give a little bit more information about our current projects on wastewater and also a bit about our future directions related to QACs. So to get started, quaternary ammonium compounds are one of the leading disinfectants um, generally for any bacterial compounds um, now that COVID-19 has uh, now that the COVID-19 pandemic has happened, um, they're definitely being used more now. Um, already, they're already all around us. Um, we can find them in mouthwashes, in nasal sprays, in uh, laundry detergents, and, and uh, fabric softeners. Um, but as I mentioned in particular, I wanna focus on the antimicrobial products that are on the right. Um, and in particular, I know you all have probably seen various of these products around, um, particularly Clorox wipes, I know that I use them a lot, um, but something that a lot of people don't know is that they do contain QACs. And if you take a closer look at a lot of these labels, um, what you're gonna be seeing are things like benzyl alcon benzyl alconium chloride or things that end in ammonium chloride. So for example, in this label here that I grabbed um, from a Clorox wipes, um, you'll see ethyl benzyl ammonium chloride. Um, this gives us indications that we're dealing with QACs. Um, with these two structures here, kind of two of the most well-known groups of QACs. So these two groups are benzyl alkyl dimethyl ammonium compounds, or BACs, and dialkyl dimethyl ammonium compounds, or DADMAX. So you'll see the two structures here. BACs are on the left and DADMAX are on the right. What actually defines quaternary ammonium compounds are first are the kind of the key structure here, which is the positive N or ammonium group here, and then also the four attached carbons. Um, so this is a quaternary ammonium compound. Uh, and then you'll see on the secondary carbon is where we'll have different alkyl groups attached, most likely for the QACs that are largely used somewhere in the 12 to 20 range. Um, and these are things that we'll find um, largely in antimicrobial products. So right now, QACs are largely being used to fight against the COVID-19 virus, particularly as a disinfectant. Um, the EPA has um, given a list of disinfectants to be used against COVID-19, uh, and QACs rank um, about roughly 50% of the total contaminants on this list, of the total disinfectants on this list. Um, of the other roughly 50%, um, it's different uh, disinfectants that we already know, something like chloride, hydrogen peroxide, or ethanol-based products. Of the 50% that are QACs, 100% contain some sort of BAC or, and or DADMAC, or some combination of the two. Um, so this tells us that these are groups that are definitely important and something we want to be paying attention to. Another important factor when thinking about QACs is their toxicity. Uh, first, we want to think about how it affects aquatic life. Um, and in particular, we've see, uh, studies have shown that plants and invertebrates tend to be the most sensitive. Um, algae have been uh, a species that have been particularly analyzed and have shown particular sensitivity to QACs. Uh, 
the current running uh, theory is that there's limited toxicity from sediment as it's as QACs won't be as bioavailable when in sediment. So benthic organisms have not been widely studied, but noted that there may be limited toxicity to that. As well, um, QACs can be fairly persistent. Um, as I noted, they can be pretty long alkyl chains, um, and these tend to stick to sediment um, and other solids as well. We also want to think about the impacts to human health. Uh, one of the biggest risks related to QACs is development of antibiotic resistance. So we depend on a handful of antibiotics um, to help us deal with any infections or any bacterial uh, related issues that we're going through. Um, and right now we are seeing that QACs could lead to a rise in uh, antibiotic resistance within these bacterial groups. Um, overall, there are still very limited uh, toxicity studies done on both aquatic and human life. And so the key takeaway really is that we need more studies to be done to really understand the impacts of QACs on both aquatic life and human health. Next, I want to talk a little bit about the environmental pathways and fate, um, and in particular related to sediment. So this is kind of a, a diagram of the bay and thinking about how QACs might reach the bay. So first, something that I focus on so far is residential. So as I've noted, any um, QACs we might use within our homes, um, maybe at work, so, stuff like that. Uh, next would be industrial. So this would be uh, anything that's uh, being used to create QACs potentially, or even now as COVID is happening to disinfect uh, different areas. Uh, and another would be stormwater. Um, when, when you hear stormwater here, really what I'm trying to say is urban runoff. Um, this means any stormwater that really comes in contact to any surfaces, in particular, that may have been sprayed down with QACs. Um, this could be something like transportation hubs. So we want to think about where might be the best places to sample. Um, and so here, we're thinking about obviously going directly for stormwater, urban runoff, and understanding um, stormwater as a pathway. Um, another would be to look at the wastewater facilities, in particular, it, looking at the influent, effluent, and biosolids. Uh, and another would be to be looking directly at the sediment within the bay. Uh, QACs um, have been known to largely end up in sediments, so this is a good, a good place to check uh, how QACs uh, are contaminating the bay. In particular, we want to do two different types of samples. Um, we want to do surface sediment samples, which would be just at the very top of the sediment layer in the bay. And we also want to do sediment core samples, um, which would examine the sediment deposition over a number of years. Uh, in particular, I want to highlight a study done by Dr. Bill Arnold, um, who is a science advisor to the Emerging Contaminants Workgroup in the RMP. So thank you so much um, for this study. And he, this is a recent pro, bo pro bono study done by Dr. Bill Arnold. Um, there were 14 QACs analyzed in 11 sites. And of those 11 sites, seven of those QACs were detected. Um, the greatest sum of QACs was detected in Grizzly Bay, which is in the Northern uh, Bay Area, um, as noted here. Uh, one of the things that we're still looking to study here is that there's no particular um, reasoning for why QACs uh, may be so uh, large there. So it's something that we want to continue to study. And the next greatest detections were found in the Lower South Bay. Uh, and this is something that we more expected as the Lower South Bay are more heavily wastewater impacted um, waters. In particular, in the bay surface sediment, we found that uh, back C18 was the most detected. It was found in nine sites. Uh, however, DADMAC C18 was found in the greatest concentrations. Um, what's also important here to know is that there was actually, the lab noted that there was low recovery rates for DADMAC C18. So these may actually be even lower estimates of the actual contamination of DADMAC C18 in the bay. Um, and just to make a note, these are both of these uh, different compounds, but on the carbon with the two, there'd be 18 um, other attached carbons as well. We also did an analysis of a sediment core that was obtained from the Central Bay in 2011. Uh, this spans roughly 60 years of sediment deposition going from 1951 to 2009. Within the sediment core, the same seven QACs that were detected in the surface sediment were detected in the sediment cores um, and with the same pattern of DATAMAC C18 having the highest concentration. What was notable here was that it was nearly 50 times greater than the next highest, uh, the next contaminant with the highest concentration, which was BAC C18. 
I wanted to show some of the data related to the sediment core. So here what you're seeing on the Y axis is the sediment layers listed from top to bottom. So the first at the top you'll see listed zero to four, which is a zero to four centimeters of the sediment core, which we've uh, mapped to be to 2009. Um, so you, from, you can see here the concentrations are relatively uh, low, but there is a relative pattern of decrease coming maybe around the 1960s, which we would note around the 20 to 22 sediment layer um, to 2009. Um, but if we look at DADMAC C18 data, we see a much more notable trend as concentrations are uh, and, and you know much greater than what was listed for the back C18. And as well, we see a greater pattern of decrease from roughly the same time from the 20 to 22 sediment layer, or roughly the 1960s to 2009. Uh, this has helped us think about where to place QACs within the RMP's risk-based framework. This is a framework that's currently used by the RMP to determine um, to determine how to determine what are the best management actions to take um, and where to place a lot of contaminants that we're studying in the bay. Um, so far, we've placed QAC in the possible concern, uh, mainly because there are still questions related to toxicity uh, that we want to examine further before um, making a particular uh, note of where QAC should lie on this table. Now I want to go ahead and talk more about the current and future directions we're taking, particularly related to wastewater. So already I've noted that there are potential sources of uh, of QACs coming into wastewater in both the industrial and residential um, sections. And I wanna take a look directly at the wastewater process. Um, so these are kind of the four general, uh, overall four to five overall, overall arching um, wastewater treatment processes that are going on. Um, and I wanna think about what can happen with QACs in terms of inhibition of activated sludge processes. So we know that this could inhibit in the aeration basin or where other where the actual processes are happening. Um, microbes can uh, the microbial community can be changing fairly rapidly, which has been shown to affect both aerobic and anaerobic uh, bioprocesses. Um, this has also been shown to be particularly problematic uh, for nitrification and denitrification processes. So it's something that we're definitely going to want to take a look at and to see if any facilities may have already noted any issues with uh, these processes. Uh, we also want to think about if QACs are ending up in the biosolids um, as they tend to sorb in solids, um, what would happen if QACs are going into fertilizer um, as biosolids may be often used for? Uh, so that's another uh, area to think about. As well, we want to think about disinfection byproducts. Several studies have shown that the QACs continuing down into the disinfection byproducts might increase the a potential for the formation of N nitrosamines um, and other disinfection byproducts. So it's something that, again, we're going to want to take a look at and see if we are seeing these effects already in local wastewater treatment plants. Uh, SFEI and the RMP are doing a study of QACs in wastewater. We're looking to study uh, influent, effluent, and biosolids uh, in the Bay Area to know if we see any particular trends related to QACs. Already, EB MUD. Uh, San Jose, Santa Clara uh, Regional Wastewater Facility and Palo Alto have agreed to participate. If any other wastewater facilities who are listening in are interested in participating, please feel free to reach out to me or any other SFEI staff member. Um, and that's something that we are looking to continue doing further. Um, something that's notable for us is that we're able to track temporal trends from the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as several of the facilities were able to archive samples from early 2020. So we'll be able to get a full look and see if QACs um, have really changed over this time. Also, we're gonna be conducting a small, a small uh, study of sediment samples in Grizzly Bay to see if we know any particular changes or can identify um, why QACs may or may not be rising there. Also, we wanna we're gonna do a small study to look at stormwater as a potential pathway. Um, as I mentioned, um, there could be QACs that are being sprayed outside um, that we're not necessarily taking note of, but we wanna see if this might be an uh, important pathway to consider. Um, so we're gonna also be screening a few samples as well during this study. Overall, um, 
what we're trying to determine is to see if there really needs to be periodic monitoring of QACs. And that's something that we're pushing for, especially as the COVID-19 pandemic has um, taken place and looks like it's going to last at least for another year or so. Um, and we also want to better understand the sources and pathways of QACs um, and figure out where are the best places to monitor. Uh, so in summary, I just wanted to let you all know that QACs are really all around us, especially during this pandemic. Um, although the studies are um, inconclusive, there are still um, more studies that need to be done to determine the presence and negative effects. Uh, I would again uh, urge everyone to consider alternatives uh, within the packaging, packaging labels themselves. I would check for ammonium chlorides. Uh, the city of San Francisco has, has, um, has given a list of COVID-19 products that it lists as safer and, a lot, and these do not contain QACs. An example is listed here uh, with this Windex product that uses lactic acid instead of QACs as a disinfectant. Um, so if you have any questions, um, please let me know and thank you for listening. Great, thanks Miguel so much for your very informative presentation. And now we're gonna move over to the segment of the uh, moderated part. So um, if I can ask all our panelists to unmute ourselves and then we will be taking questions from the group. You can type your questions in. Um, question is from uh, David Jinkson and this is for Miguel. And he said, you indicated that QACs affect denitrification. Is this just because their inhibition of nitrification just means there's no nitrate to denitrify? Uh, yeah, essentially that's a problem. It's going to cause uh, problems in the actual mechanisms that are going on with the bacteria digesting now QACs as well as everything else. Um, and in addition, also just changing the actual bacterial composition that's going on in that particular microbial community. As we know, we want certain denitrifiers to exist or nitrifiers and denitrifiers to exist there. Um, so it's important that um, we think about that as well. Okay, thank you, Miguel. And Robert Curgeon has a question for you too. And he wanted to know what was happening in the 1960s that resulted in high concentrations of QACs and is there a connection with the wastewater treatment plants? So there's um, two things that kind of popped into my head when I thought about this. Uh, one was um, the improved wastewater treatment processes since then. Um, so obviously I think that that's helped a lot um, in decreasing the actual QACs that may end up in the environment. Um, the other would be that DADMAX um, were actually more widely used during the 1960s and since roughly the 1980s have been decreasing in use. So I think that's one of the big reasons that we're seeing that um, big peak during the 1960s for DADMAX. Great, thank you. And let's see. Um, okay, another one for you. It says, you do not mention the influence of QAC on effluent toxicity. And this is from David Jenkins, and he's encountered such toxicity at quite low QAC concentrations in some plants. Right, sorry, that's really uh, just on me. I wasn't as clear, um, but that is also true. Um, and that's something that, again, um, does tell us about potential toxicity effects of QACs, um, but further studies really do need to be done. Okay, great. And then um, we've got a question from uh, Eric Dunleavy of San Jose, and he wanted to know um, if Peter, if you can talk a little bit about how you manage nutrients in Chesapeake Bay would be if you didn't have the desired water quality and uh, live and response goals uh, which is a different situation in San Francisco Bay. Um, since so far we haven't really seen the negative effects and we're trying to prioritize management actions. And, and uh, thanks for the great question there. And, and at least thinking about other avenues of what we, we do talk about and have spoken about and, and whether or not there are human health endpoints, uh, even if we didn't have, well, First, I'll go back and say, if we didn't have the dissolved oxygen looking at fish and shellfish, we also consider light, the light field, which is influenced by sediment, nutrient conditions that may be either through dissolved organic carbon delivery or, or from, uh, fr from plankton production that blocks light. So it's not a, the, the total maximum daily load doesn't reflect solely the dissolved oxygen habitat element, and therefore nutrient controls could come in if we we're looking strictly at producing more aquatic vegetation, still living resource, but, but a different endpoint than the, than the fish and shellfish. 
And if we didn't have those, we've spoken about controlling the production of toxin and limiting harmful algal blooms. Uh, that, that's not necessarily a, a that, that's more of a human health side. If we don't want that to get into our living resources and feed back into our food resources or to our recreational opportunities. So the, the human health dimension and what the linkages are, indirect effects could feed back into other endpoints that, that could need uh, nutrient management independent of managing for fish and shellfish, dissolved oxygen type, type habitat classifications. Great, thanks so much, Peter. And Miguel, we've got another question for you. Um, and they want, someone, uh, Sholo wants to know, he recognizes this answer may not yet be known, but do you have any hypothesis about whether samples collected near hospitals, healthcare facilities would contain higher um, QAC concentrations compared to those collected near residences or other facilities? Yeah, already we're, Pretty, it, it seems a, a pretty clear hypothesis that most likely QACs are going to be higher even before COVID-19. Several studies had already noted um, that um, wastewater effluents from hospitals tend to show more QACs in general. Um, so that is something that we're um, trying to look into. Um, obviously, it's a little more difficult um, to find particular wastewater streams that only have hospital-related um, wastewater or that have that as a dominant flow. Um, so that's something that we're still looking into. Great. And then another question is uh, for you, Miguel, is, is whether these uh, concentration differences in sediments are explained by sediment texture or higher percent fines uh, where California concentrations are, are higher? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not exactly sure for this question. Um, this is something that definitely I think Bill Arnold would be able to answer and something that he's still um, working on. Okay, great. Thank you. Feel free, we've got a couple of minutes left. If anybody else wants to um, uh, put any more questions in the chat, but it looks like right now, I think they've all been answered. Eileen, I put a couple more questions in the chat that the speakers had answered um, through the, um, just by typing the answers that I thought would be good um, to just vocally share as well. Yeah, our speakers have done a great job answering questions. Is there any other that you want me to ask for the group, uh, Melissa? Um, maybe just one from Alan Mearns that says, um, for Peter, you, you have different, um, it looks like you have different DO criteria for different segments of Chesapeake Bay. Um, and um, it look, um, so the question says, it looks like you had an um, effort in 2003 to develop new criteria and why did you change those criteria um, in that review? Ah, okay, I'll try to unpack all that quickly. The 2003 was really the culmination of a lot of work that was trying to set, set the, the goals for the, for the bay and recognizing that certain areas of the bay, like the upper parts of our tidal tributaries, don't necessarily stratify and don't, in the way that when we're in the middle of the bay, we get a, a picnic line. So we have this open water zone, a mid water that we call deep water zone. And then below that, through temperature and salinity differences, a, a largely capped off deep channel zone. And each of those has some expectation about what we can do for management in terms of the layers of the water column. So it, in our deeper areas, we can have those three habitats in our upstream, up, up river tidal areas. Uh, we don't get the same habitats. So these different designated uses were designed with different criteria respecting the different habitats that were available and what the likely changes were. Uh, in the deepest channel, we're looking for one milligram per liter to return, which is sufficient to, to sort of start, start withholding the phosphorus in the sediment again, as well as introduce enough oxygen down there for some some worms to live where we don't have them now. And just getting that basic biology in place, that basic chemistry back would help with that feedback cycle of reducing nutrient nutrient exchange in the water column uh, to limit eutrophication effects. So each of those for the parts of those reasons, the, the different habitat recognition with salinity zone temperatures and 
and what the habitats are available influenced what criteria were designed for each of those zones over time. And 2003 was really the codification of decades of looks at ways to how, do, how can we get that assemblage of respecting the different habitats out there, agree on a framework, and then implement that framework that's adopted into water quality standards that they, the states have been using since the mid 2000s once they adopted them. So that's been the, uh, that was pre-TMDL. The TMDL then, then built off of that, that framework in terms of what the expectations were. So uh, 2003 was more the, the birthday than it was the, the change of the, the criteria, I would say. And we've been, since that time, there have been relatively, well, there have been zero modification to the dissolved oxygen criteria. The James River chlorophyll program just went, underwent about a seven year review of the chlorophyll criteria and uh, have, have made just minor modifications to what the original criteria design were. So uh, they've, they've held up through the years, given the best available science and new science that's come on board. Great, thanks, Peter. Well, I wanna thank all three of our great speakers today for their very informative and insightful presentations. I also wanna thank our audience for the thoughtful questions. And just really on behalf of the wastewater agencies in the Bay Area, we're really appreciative of the regional monitoring program that's led by the regional board and SFEI. And we really appreciate them collecting and analyzing the long-term data, collaborating with other scientists like we've had today, really keeping us on the cutting edge to make sure we're supporting decision-making to improve the health of San Francisco Bay. So I just wanna say thank you to all of you and um, we look forward to the rest of the day. V very interesting panel. Great job. Honored to be here. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we will be taking a, a short 10 minute break and we'll be starting up again at 1040 with a sediment session. So we'll, we'll see you back